creative people love Florida. If you're a painter, photographer, or wordsmith, this state provides an endless stream of subjects. One of my favorite Florida writers is the author and journalist Craig Pittman. He covers the environment for the Tampa Bay Times, and his new book, Oh Florida, is on the New York Times bestseller list for travel books. I caught up with the well-journeyed journalist at Selby Library in Sarasota. He was introducing a film based on a book by another celebrated Florida author, John D. McDonald. We'll introduce um, Craig Pittman. Have you already heard of Craig Pittman out there today? Craig, come on up. Um, I wanted Craig to be a part of our One Book uh, program this year because he's an author, but above and beyond that, he writes about specifically Florida environmental issues. And I really felt it was important to have his voice and that angle in our programming. And so he's done a couple of programs with us, and he's going to introduce uh, the film for you today. He is uh, an author and a journalist of the Tampa Bay Times. So Craig, take it away. I didn't realize that that's what you wanted me to introduce, and I thought I was the model for the chalk outline. Uh, it's very gratifying to see so many of you here for this. I, I hope you guys are taking a picture of this and you'll send it to the people who make DVDs to show them, hey, you should make this available on DVD for a lot, a lot more people to be able to see this at home. Uh, in his Travis McGee books, and in many of his other novels, uh, Johnny McDonald often wrote about Florida's beauty, the appeal to nature, and the risk of ruining it. Uh, he had an MBA, so he knew how business worked and how conscienceless and corrupt it could be, and how it could turn a gorgeous public resource like a waterfront into a lifeless ruin just for private profit. Uh, once he and his family moved to Sarasota in 1951, they lived on the water, and he enjoyed boating and fishing, as many of us did. He loved watching what he called the Armada of Pelicans, wheeling above the waves. In a panther paw print that he saw once, he, he saw evidence that Florida's wilderness had not yet been wiped out. As with many people who fall in love with Florida, he became an extremely vocal environmental activist, battling dredge and fill projects that would disrupt Sarasota Bay's ecosystem. He smuggled those arguments into many of his uh, thriller plots, starting with 1953's Dead Low Tide. Our award nominee today, Tim Dorsey, uh, calls him Florida's Nostradamus because he was writing about protecting our environment long before we knew that it was an issue. Over and over, McDonald warned Floridians about what he called the fast buck artists who would asphalt the entire coast, fill every bay, and slay every living thing incapable of carrying a wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Author Jim Harrison called McDonald's novel A Flash of Green, America's first ecological novel. It was published in 1962, the same year as Rachel Carson's nonfiction blockbuster, Silver and Silent Spring. The novel features a crooked county commissioner pushing a dredge and fill project. What? <laughs> and a morally conflicted newspaper reporter. McDonald had to fight his publisher to keep the title. I don't want to give away the reason why. In 1984, the great Florida director, Victor Nunez, turned McDonald's novel into the magnificent movie you're about to enjoy. Sadly, it's not been made widely available to the public, so today's showing is a rare treat, similar to seeing a flash of green. And for that, we can thank the generosity of Mr. Jakes for making this possible. Ladies and gentlemen, keep your eyes open so you can finally see something many Floridians have not, a flash of green. The film marked the end of a celebration of what would have been John D. McDonald's 100th birthday. I would have loved to interview him, but I have been hoping to interview Craig for quite a long time. After the film, we sat down to talk. Well, thanks for taking time to do this. Sure. Um, and congratulations on oh, your thank book. You. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I only have one complaint about it. Yeah. Um, 
my wife stole mine. <laughs> So, I gotta buy another one. Oh, well. <laughs> Better buy a backup just in case you lose it. <laughs> I know you're a journalist and you're an environmental writer. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Um, well, uh, when I started in journalism, I didn't even know that beat existed. Uh, I covered county government, I covered state politics, covered the legislature that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I got to the Sarasota Herald Tribune uh, and it covered county government again and politics. And my boss could tell I was getting kind of burned out on that. And he said, uh, let's think about something else for you to do. What else is interesting to you? And I did a little research and came back to him and said, you know, there's a lot of environmental and science related institutions here in Sarasota. We should probably cover them. How about a beat where I cover the environment and science? He said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So I wrote about Selby Botanical Gardens. I wrote about Moat Marine Lab, uh, you know, New College and, and environmental issues that came up and, you know, that kind of thing. I did features. I did some, some uh, news stories. And uh, uh, I decided this is a really cool beat. I should try and do this again. And so when I got to the, uh, what was then the St. Petersburg Times, and I got hired to work in a little bureau and cover small towns. But I bumped into the guy who had been the environmental reporter there for several years. And we wound up at the same event together and I said, you have the best job in journalism. And he was like, yeah, you're right. But I said, no, really, I mean it. So uh, eventually when that job came open, I went for it and I uh, was very happy to get it. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I, I do this field journal. Yeah. For the station, and it was kind of the same thing. And they said, we need like a new program, something interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I have an idea. <laughs> That's said, what it takes. Try it. Yeah, we'll yeah. Try it for a little bit, and that one was three and a half years ago. Yeah. So That's great. It's very cool. It is the best job mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't run out of stories in Florida. No, but that's see, that's a good thing. You never run out of stories. You, uh, it's like it's like being presented with a dessert bar that never ends. It's an infinite <laughs> dessert bar, and you you know you have to kind of pick your shots. Okay, today I'm going to eat key lime pie, and tomorrow I'll get tiramisu. You know, you can't. You can never run out of them. And I mean, really, what a great job! You get paid to ride around in a boat now and again, or. Hike, yeah. hike through a forest, tromp through a swamp. I mean, that's a good job in anybody's book, I think. Yeah. So, it, it, it's it's very cool. And uh, although, like a dessert bar, you can get sick to your stomach. Well, if you eat too much, <laughs> if you eat too much, not the wrong thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of which, uh, one of the stories I'm following, and, and you're following too, from a different angle. Is the algae bloom? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and you found a new one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's really kind of scary. It is. It is. Um, yeah. The the toxic algae bloom going on on the state's east coast and to a limited extent on the west coast, and in Lake Okeechobee. The the thing about that is that this is at least the second go around because I covered it in 2005 also, and now here we are in 2016 yeah. and it's back. And I just remember in 2005, all the people who said, oh, this is horrible, we've got to stop it. They came up with all these grand plans to make sure it never happened again, and then nothing. Because the algae bloom went away, and the solutions were all really expensive, and the people involved you know, moved on to other things, and a whole bunch of new voters came in who didn't know what the issues were, and made choices based on who had the best TV ads, and that's the way things go in Florida. And now here we are confronting it all over again, and it's far worse than it was in 20, in 2005. And once again, people are all upset and excited, and they're talking about very expensive solutions, and I'm just waiting to see if anything changes from 2005. One of the things I'm sure you've encountered this, too, is that you know, I've looked at the statements that from the governor, mm -hmm. our, our enlightened leader in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. And uh, in the statements, even from uh, our, our local legislators, even our even Bill Nelson, mm -hmm. 
and no one mentions agriculture. They, uh, they certainly get an earful about it, though. Because <laughs> I, I saw where uh, Senator Rubio went to visit the, uh, the, the toxic algae bloom coast, and people were there yelling at him about agriculture and about that they wanted to send the water south into the sugar lands. The, that's been a proposal that's been around for a long time, and the sugar people don't want it, and they've got the money and the political influence to make sure it doesn't happen, and so far it hasn't. Is that going to change? I don't know. What's your dream story? What would you love to cover in this state? Just whether it's happened or hasn't happened yet. Dream story, man, that's tough. Um, uh, gosh. Um, I didn't promise to be easy. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's not, it's not really something you think about either. It's, you know, what's happening today. It's all I can do to keep up with what's really happening. That's right. <laughs> um, I mean, probably something involving Florida history suddenly reaching out and slapping people in the face today. I always like those stories. I got to do a story not too long ago, um, sort of like that, where plans for the new private spaceport uh, near Cape Canaveral were being put in jeopardy because they had uncovered this archaeological find from uh, an, an English sugar plantation from, I think, the, was it the 1730s? And it was this magnificent find. It was probably the most complete uh, sugar plantation they had discovered on the entire East Coast. And there was a wonderful backstory involving the planter. He had fallen in love with one of his slaves, and so he freed her and married her, and they had kids. And it was it was just a great and you know and the people with the with the spaceport program they were trying to figure out what to do about this and worried it was going to blow up their whole idea and it was just it was really it was an interesting story and so any any story where the past comes out and sticks out its foot and trips up the present I like those stories <laughs> that's cool yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm also thinking about wouldn't it be great if like the coral reefs started rebounding or that would be cool too or we clean up <laughs> <Good job. laughs> That would be no, cool that's ridiculous. I have not <laughs> had the opportunity to write that story yet. But, you know, you never know. You never know. I mean, there are success stories in, in Florida, Florida's environment. The restoration of the Kissimmee River is is a, just a great story to tell. That, yeah. You know, they straightened it out. The Corps of Engineers straightened it out and it became basically a polluted ditch. And now they put it, the bends back in and the birds are coming back and the mud flats are back and lots of... The ecology is returning there, and it's sort of a, people describe it as a, a preview of what the Everglades could be if they ever get around to finishing ever or even starting Everglades restoration. So, we'll see. I mean, there, there are plenty of opportunities for ecological restoration in Florida. The recovery of the uh, snail kite. Well, but that's a that's a that's, yeah, that's an odd. A, this, yeah, I like a I do sword. like that. I like that story too because something you think would be bad turns out to be good. Where suddenly they're rebounding, not because the native apple snails are back, but because these invasive snails have come in, and the, and the snail kites are like, hey, we'll eat those. And so just because you have all these, you, you know, the, suddenly this invasive species is actually a good thing. So I like those sort of. Yeah. And those stories that don't quite go the way you think they're going to go. <laughs> That's and the limbkin cool. has exploded because yeah. of the snake. Yeah. So um, any of those stories like that, and any story where I get an excuse to go outdoors is a yeah. good story. And sometimes I've gotten the opportunity to cover stuff that then becomes, it's so cool it becomes a challenge to actually write about it. Uh, I went to do a story about Fish Eating Creek when mm -hmm. the state finally got control of that property. And the guy who was showing me around for Likes Brothers took me up on the dike going around Lake Okeechobee. And he said, I just, we had to be out there at 7 o'clock in the morning. He said, I just want you to see, see this. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, we're on the dike. And all of a sudden, the trees along the dike erupt as hundreds and hundreds of swallowtail kites emerge from, from, the, from the trees. They've been migrating down, and they're now you know, taking, taking wing in the morning to basically get their breakfast and then 
circled like a tornado of birds going way up high in the sky. And it was just, it was magnificent. I had a hard time writing that. The photographer had a hard time with it because, you know, he could just take yeah. pieces of the sky. He couldn't show that they were basically covering the whole sky. And, and probably three-fifths of the entire world population of snail kites, I mean, uh, swallowtail kites, was present right at that moment, right in front of our eyes. One of my favorite birds. Yeah. It's just a gorgeous bird. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a reason why they use that as the symbol for the Great Florida Birding Trail. Yeah. It's a very cool bird to see. Yeah. And I, I got to see most of them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's way cool. It's yeah. very cool. I got to, I got to, when I was working for the Sarasota paper, I got to go out with some volunteers from Moat Marine Lab and watch a loggerhead sea turtle laying its eggs. And that's, that was, and I mean, at one point, you know, they, we, you know, we backed off when it first came up on the, on the sand, but once it started laying, they said, we can go, go up on, on it then, because they, they, they're in the zone. So I was as close to that turtle as I am to you, and they were taking measurements of the carapace, and they clipped a metal tag on its flipper, and you know, kind of did a quick visual inspection to make sure the eggs looked okay, and then when she was slowing down, they said, okay, well, let's back off and go back and hit behind the sand dunes. And we watched her pull herself, you know, cover up the nest and pull herself back down into the water. And as she swam away, it was a very dark night. It was a new moon that night. As she swam away, there were these flashes of bioluminescence from her flippers as she swam back out into the gulf. And I was like, how am I supposed to write this? <laughs> how can I tell this story? It's so hard to convince people that this is one of the most magic places on the planet. Yeah. You know, because the, all they see is condos. Well, and, and the you know, we're the punchline state, you know. Because people right. think Florida now. They, they think, oh, you know, wacky criminals and, and crooked politicians and stuff like that. And yeah, we got that galore, and, yeah. you know, by the, by the ton. But we've also got all this cool stuff that happens here, too. And, Honestly, you can't have one without the other. So I tried to put both of them in, into my book, O oh, Florida. And so I tell, I actually tell the the sea turtle story in there, but it's in there with you know the guy who got in the road rage incident and ran over himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was reading the book and I went, you know what? I come from the only state that could possibly give Florida a run for its money. Which one? Texas. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll see when we get when you get to the, uh, the the next to last chapter, a whole new you. Uh, there's a line in there that Florida is 49th in funding for mental health programs, which always makes me say, "Thank God for Texas." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it, it seems that you know corruption in Texas is a cultural thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then look at Alabama, where you've got you've had the governor, the speaker of the house, and the president of the senate all facing criminal charges yeah. at the same time. So, see, in Texas, they wouldn't have faced. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> but at least in Florida, the feds have been active. So, yeah. <laughs> not just the state. Yeah, I think uh, there's enough attention on the state now. Maybe mm. we have a little bit of leeway. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, of course, we do have. Eventually, we'll have a, a new legislature. Yeah, uh, here's that. Well, I just governor. I just remember what I read from the uh, when the FBI sent in an, an undercover operative because they were investigating corruption in uh, where they thought they were targeting one particular county commissioner, and then he wound up giving out bribes to everybody and his brother because he said they all had their hands out. They found out this one guy was getting paid off. They're like, hey, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> and they wound up uh, issuing indictments for people in two different counties. <laughs> that's how that's how far it went. Well, there's hope. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Craig. This, this has been great. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything that you think you know the people who watch the Field Journal might find interesting or amusing uh, besides reading your book? Well, I mean. Like, like I said, I mean, I, I, in the book I tried to point out that there's lots of cool stuff in Florida. We have this award-winning state park system. It's very cool from the, the soaring 40-foot high dunes at Topsail Hill State Park to the depths of the Devil's Millhopper State Park outside Gainesville. There's just this wide range of things to see and to do. 
here and you know there's lots of cool wildlife like manatees just please don't try and ride on their back like yeah. that one lady did um, and uh, you know we have these world-class beaches that have often been ranked among the most beautiful in the world if not the most beautiful um, where you know people get into fights and throw starfish at each other <laughs> but and so that I mean that's sort of my point is we've got lots of cool stuff in Florida to go with all the kooky stuff and they go hand in hand. You, yeah. you have to have, if you got one, you have to take the other one too. So just sort of embrace the weird and let your freak flag fly. And here, here, here's the big question. Okay. Does Florida breed them or attract them? Oh, both. Oh, absolutely both. I mean, you know, the weirdness started before we were ever even a state, you know, when, they, yeah. when the visitors were saying that we were a rogue's paradise. You know, and half the people here were con men, and the other half were their victims who, who were broke. Uh, and continued on through the 1910s, 1920s, the big land boom, all the hucksters running around doing outrageous stuff. So, and then a lot of people come here trying to have, you know, second, third, and fourth chances. My favorite example has always been Carlo Ponzi, the guy who invented the Ponzi scheme. He gets caught in Boston, gets out on bond. Where does he go? Florida, where he immediately gets involved in a real estate fraud. So, so it's a mix of both. But, you know, that's going to happen because we've got 20 million people now with the third most populous state. And then you layer 100 million visitors on top of that. And it's not evenly distributed. We're all kind of crammed into that swath around the coast. It's maybe 35, 40 miles wide or along I-4. And so when you jam that many people together in such a small space, they're bound to start you know, ramming their cars into each other, chasing each other around with machetes, arguing over whose dog pooped on whose lawn, you know, that kind of thing. So it's bound to happen. It's bound to happen. And as we get more people, it's just going to get weirder. <laughs> Thanks again. Sure.